Hi guys, I have some more vocabulary words for you that have to do with dissolving. Here are two of them, polar and nonpolar. Oops, not no polar, nonpolar. Sorry about that. So polar refers to having two sides, but in chemistry it specifically refers to having two oppositely charged sides. Nonpolar means you really don't have any charges. And this is true of molecules and atoms. Atoms have charges in them, so depending how they connect with each other, they may be left with no real charge because they've balanced out their charges with each other when they connect it. Or they could be left with some overall charge because they haven't balanced it out. The water molecule that you see here with this big happy face right here has very strong polar charges. The hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom are sharing what we call electrons, which are where the charges and atoms really come from. And when they share them, they share them very unequally. You can think of the oxygen atom as being like a big hog that pulls all the negatively charged electrons towards itself, and the hydrogen atoms are sort of left with no negative charge in them. And so the side of the water molecule that has hydrogens on it picks up a positive charge. And the side of the water molecule that has oxygen on it picks up a negative charge. In chemistry, we use this weird little Greek letter D that looks like that, which means um, in chemistry, partial charge. So it's not like a totally full positive charge and a totally full negative charge, but it has this partial charge to it. This results in water molecules clinging to each other. They cling to each other because one side of each molecule has a positive charge and the other side has a negative charge. And you may have heard that opposites attract. And so every water molecule has the ability to attract a neighboring water molecule. And we saw this when we put water and alcohol side by side and compared how clingy they were. We saw that water tends to beat up, alcohol tends to spread out, water takes a lot of heat to boil away, but alcohol starts evaporating the minute you bring it into the room. So the intermolecular forces that we talked about that hold things together are very strong for water. On the other hand, over here to the right, I have a fat molecule. This is actually what fat looks like. Fat is a big, long chain of carbon atoms, and on one end, you have a couple of oxygens, and those little white ones are hydrogens. So a fat molecule does have some charge to it. It's not completely chargeless, but it doesn't have anywhere near the imbalance that a water molecule does. So overall, fat is mostly nonpolar. It really doesn't have any charges. Now you might say, why the heck do I care? And the answer is that if you want to know if something's going to dissolve another something, you want to ask, are these molecules inside the thing alike? Because polar stuff dissolves polar stuff, and nonpolar stuff dissolves nonpolar stuff. Just the other day, Mrs. Breslin sent a student over to see if I had anything that would dissolve a permanent marker off of her whiteboard. If this has ever happened to you, now you know it can be really annoying. You accidentally use a permanent marker when you meant to use a dry erase marker, and the marker is now seemingly stuck forever onto your surface. But that's not true. Water does not dissolve permanent marker. That's why we call it permanent marker. That marker is made from a chemical that does not dissolve in water because permanent marker is not made from a polar dye. It's made from a nonpolar dye. So the molecules of that dye don't have any charges. And because of this, water cannot dissolve it. Water does all its dissolving using its charges to pull apart the charges in something else. It'll attract itself to a positive or a negative charge on another molecule, but if there aren't any, it has no chance to pull it apart. On the other hand, nonpolar stuff can dissolve other nonpolar stuff with forces we don't talk about in this class, but they have the ability to dissolve each other. So I gave Miss Breslin some of my alcohol because alcohol is a little less polar than water, so it's usually able to dissolve a permanent marker. And that's how she was able to clean her whiteboard without having to get in trouble for ruining the whole thing. The next set of vocabulary words involves these terms on this screen. Unsaturated, saturated, supersaturated, and something called precipitate or precipitate. Solutions can be unsaturated, saturated, 
and sometimes, if you're lucky, supersaturated. Unsaturated means that something can hold more. Like a sponge that you've put, put some water in the sponge, but you could put more water in that sponge before it starts dripping water out. Solutions are like this. If I put a little bit of sugar or salt into some water and stir it up, I could probably then put another handful of sugar or salt in there and get more to dissolve. But at some point, I will reach a point where no more will dissolve. At that point, I'm saturated. There's really no way to tell when something is saturated because you just have to keep adding more and more solute until you reach a point where you put that last spoonful in and it doesn't dissolve. And we'll do this in the lab. You'll try this out to see how much copper sulfate can you get, that's that blue powder, how much copper sulfate can you get in five milliliters of water and how much can you get to dissolve in say 20 milliliters of water. And how much can dissolve really depends on how attracted the particles are to each other, how much space there is between the particles, which has to do with how hot they are, and um, all sorts of things. So some times you can find that a solution appears to your eye to be saturated because there's stuff sitting on the bottom of your test tube or your beaker and you're like, well, that stuff must not be able to dissolve. But you come back like 20 minutes later and it's gone. Super annoying. It can be very hard to tell if something is done dissolving. So we'll talk about that when we do that lab work. Every once in a while, you can make what's called a supersaturated solution. In a supersaturated solution, somehow you've managed to get your solvent to hold more solute than it should be able to hold. This can happen because it's kind of like, have you ever seen a, a magnet holding a bunch of paper clips? Like in this picture? You see, the paper clips that are being held by this magnet, they're being held by magnetic attraction. That's really the same force that holds solute particles in a solution. It's the same exact electromagnetic force, just on a smaller scale with the atoms. If you think about it, you could probably pick up more paper clips than this um, magnet is actually holding if you did it very carefully. If you added them one at a time, you might be able to make an incredibly long chain of paper clips. But at some point, you're going to you know, shake your hand a little bit or somebody's going to step too loudly in the room and everything's going to fall. That is what happens with supersaturated solutions. If you've ever seen a cool YouTube video where somebody like taps the side of a bottle and then all of the sudden stuff starts to come out of solution and just form this big giant crystal, that's usually done with supersaturated solutions. You added solute really, really slowly and got it to sort of float around in the solvent even though technically it's really not capable of holding that much solute, just like this magnet probably can't hold very more, many more paper clips naturally, but if we did it really carefully, we could probably get it to do it. When your paper clips all fall off, we don't have a special word for that, although you might think it's raining paper clips. And when you think of rain, you might have heard the word precipitation, which is a term that we use um, to describe rain and snow. They're both precipitation. When something precipitates, it falls out of solution. And so if you have a supersaturated solution and you tap the side of your container and all of the stuff suddenly comes flying out, you will get precipitate. Any solute that refuses to dissolve is called precipitate. Over here on the right hand side after my supersaturated solution, let me put those definitions up. Once something falls out of your supersaturated solution, we call it a precipitate. And precipitate comes out in little crystals of solute over on the right hand side. So just to review, you can make solutions that are unsaturated, meaning they can dissolve more solute if you give them enough time and you're patient. Saturated solutions, which are holding the maximum amount of solute that they can hold, supersaturated solutions, which are somehow holding more than they should because we very carefully balanced it, and precipitate, which is whatever undissolved solute you have at the bottom of your container. And at the very beginning of this tutorial, we talked about polar versus nonpolar molecules and the fact that like dissolves like. Here's a little chemistry joke for you. Why do water and oil or water and fat not mix? Well, it's because water is polar and polar molecules have charges and that's how they dissolve stuff and fat is nonpolar 
There are some tiny little charges over here on this side, little negative charge, but it's really not enough to attract water to it. It's not because he's fat. Okay, see you guys in class.